pretty horrible place. But what's a gulag? A gulag is a, essentially a constant Soviet concentration camp for their own citizens who had misbehaved in one way or another, uh, misbehaved in quotation marks, of course, had said the wrong thing, had the wrong opinion, you know, whatever, were, were the wrong ethnicity at points in time, you know. Um, and uh, it was starvation diet, forced labor. I think approximately 10% of the population would, be, would end up being dead at the end of a year. Um, and of course, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, one of my heroes, he wrote the Gulag Archipelago, in which he exposed for the first time, really, the extent of what was happening. Um, and the West came to understand Russia, but we've forgotten it since, I'd suggest. Yeah, and that's where you come in. Well, we came to understand Russia very slowly. There were a lot of people, even in those days, even after it had been revealed, who wanted to whitewash uh, everything that had been happening in the Soviet Union. So not only my own experience growing up in the tail end of the Soviet Union, but also the histories of my family, hearing my grandmother in Ukraine, uh, alive today, she's 96 years old, you can go and talk to her, perfectly compass mentis, lived through the German occupation of, of Soviet Ukraine. Uh, her husband, my grandfather, was taken as a slave laborer to Germany. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing I would say about him is, uh, the most dangerous thing you could have been in that period of time was someone who'd been in Germany and come back because everyone like that, Stalin would get straight in the camp or executed because they were a, a traitor or, or, or whatever. So my grandfather never told anyone he'd been taken to Germany until the Soviet Union collapsed. He waited 50 years, John. That's how terrified he was. That was the fear that people had in their minds. And so I grew up with a family full of these stories. My grandmother, who I mentioned, uh, her family were kulaks, uh, wealthy peasants. They had a horse. So that, that was how wealthy they were. Uh, and uh, when the Soviets came and began to expropriate everybody's property, uh, they sent, uh, basically took the house, took every, all their possessions, threw them out onto the street, and actually deported them to Siberia. And my grandmother's little brother, she, she tells the story, starved on the way as a, as a boy. So I grew up with all of that, um, all of these stories of my family. Um, and now I live here in the heart of one of the most prosperous societies in the world. So that contrast, I think, helps me to see things perhaps from a slightly different perspective to most people. And that's why it's so valuable. Uh, and in recent times, uh, because of the Ukrainian uh, conflict, mm. you've been so sought out as a commentator that I'm, it's just wonderful to be able to talk to you today. One more question before we, uh, we go to the, the themes we're talking about uh, as, a, as a, the object of our conversation. It strikes me, and you're a classic example of it, we think of Russians as very deep thinkers. You mentioned Solzhenitsyn, but some of the great Russian th thinkers, writers, people of extraordinary depth. And you have that about you, but you also have this capacity to laugh and make others laugh. You're a comedian, although at the moment I think probably you're on a you... break from comedy now. Yeah, yeah, uh, for for reasons we don't even need to get into. Just uh, lifestyle-wise, it, it wasn't working for me. But uh, you know, it's it's a misnomer about Russians. Russians have a great sense of humor. Yeah, actually, yeah. Uh, a great sense of humor and and a very dark one for for reasons that are fairly obvious. If you if you open a history book about the history of Russia, you kind of have to be able to laugh at dark things if you want to have a sense of humor. So Russians have a great sense. It's different to, to the one that people have in the West. But and also, you know, I, 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 um, I wouldn't want to uh, let on um, I wouldn't want to allow you to compare me in any way to Alexander Solzhenitsyn. You know, uh, I, I don't claim to, to, be, to think as deeply or to have gone through anything. So he went, he was in the gulag for 10 years. I went to a British boarding school. That's where the similarities end. Yeah, except that you're helping us unpack a society we don't understand, mm. we've been lazy about, and now suddenly we have to grapple with it because anything could happen as you and I sit here. Mm. I think we'd agree. Mm. Uh, in, in this part of the world, and as, a, as an Australian, I'm struck by the fact that people here are not as aware of what's happening in China. Mm. In Australia, in my view, we're not as aware of either situation as we ought to be, and you can help us understand it. So, so, so to come to, you wrote recently a fascinating article. It's a really interesting article um, on the support that Putin has even now amongst Russians. It's, it's surprisingly high. It appears to be directly correlated to the age of the Russians. Um, I sense that most Westerners simply won't be able to understand that because of their experience of democratic capitalism. Um, it's so different to the experience of Russians. Can you unpack for us why 
contrary to what we might expect, the anti-democratic Putin actually enjoys not perhaps popularity, but amazingly strong support among many Russians. Mm. Well, uh, <laughs> I, I, was, I was probably going to begin my answer by asking you a question. Uh, what do you think of when I say the word democracy? Uh, are people who are, in the end, able to dictate to government what it is uh, that they want and to remove them peacefully if they don't deliver. Mm. And with that the comes point of a pencil, not prosperity, a gun. Yeah. stability, mm. security, and many other things. Whilst people remain true to the ideals of democracy yes. and understand its foundations. Quite, quite, quite But quite. only while. Well, we can get into that conversation yeah, yeah. <laughs> separately. But if we stick with the answer to your que initial question is, when you think of democracy, you think about the ability to remove a leader peacefully, yeah. transition of power, security, stability, yeah. and prosperity. That's why we all think democracy is great. If you say democracy to a Russian person, well, you've got to look at our history. We've never had democracy. Yeah. Russia has never had, Russia, the first uh, mention historically of Russia is 882, um, so 1200. 1200 years ago, a long time ago, in that entire period, there's never been a single democratic transition of power, ever, ever. Yeah. The only time Russia experimented with quote unquote democracy, and for people listening, I'm using quotation marks, was the period between 1991 yeah. and, the period, and 1999 when Vladimir Putin becomes prime minister and eventually president. That period is probably one of the most traumatic periods in the history of anyone alive in Russia today. It was a time in which uh, you went from a poor and unfree society, which was the Soviet Union, in which most people didn't really know how poor and how unfree they were, to a society of complete chaos, rampant crime. Uh, you went from, you know, you were a university professor with a respectable job and, and today and tomorrow, and I mean tomorrow you were selling your belongings in the street. Your children who were in school and doing well, and all, you, all they needed to do was get the right grades and go to the right university, and then they would have a career. It wouldn't be a great career, but it would be one that would, their life would be okay. Suddenly your son was sent, shipped off to fight in Chechnya, which you'd never heard of before, and your daughter was a prostitute. Because that was how quickly the society changed. I'm not saying that was every single person's experience, but we all knew somebody. We all knew somebody who'd fallen, a woman who'd fallen prey to the slave trade, or a person who, uh, you know, lost a son in Chechnya, or was wounded, or was sent to the military, uh, or someone who ended up going from being wealthy to being in extreme poverty, people who drank themselves to death, people who took drugs and, and, and overdosed on drugs. We all, and the thing that was most important about that, it was through no fault of your own. The society collapsed around you and everything you'd worked or all your savings, gone, overnight, gone. Think about that. Yeah. Think how shocking that is to people. It's very hard to come to grips with. Yeah, it's hard to imagine. People will listen to this and go, oh, but you can't imagine it. Mm. Everything in your life, think about your life now, your family, your friends, your finances, how much money you have, your job, all of that gone through no fault of your own. You've done nothing wrong, but the society has collapsed and suddenly it's chaos. And you are not prepared for this market capitalist society. You were told all your life, be a good Soviet citizen, go to school, go to university, do your job, do what you're told. And you did, and you had a decent life. And suddenly all of that's over, right? It was extremely traumatic, extremely shocking. And Vladimir Putin is widely seen in Russia as the person who ended that chaos. He comes in, he ends the war in Chechnya, he deals with the threat of terrorism, uh, he stabilizes the country economically, mainly because oil prices are extremely high, and so he's able to share some of that wealth with the people. And so yes, of course, and also importantly as well, he stabilizes the country by nationalizing the crime and corruption. Crime and corruption doesn't end, it just becomes controlled, and it is exercised through the state. He is the person who is the chief oligarch, and he has other oligarchs under him who are all appointed. They're all appointed. There is no such thing as an independent, uh, there is no real private property at that level in Russia. If you're a billionaire, you're not really a billionaire. You're a billionaire as long as you are faithful to the regime, mm -hmm. right? So it's controlled. That rampant sort of uh, capitalism, exploitative capitalism that we saw in the 90s is over in Russia. It's controlled, it's nationalized. So he's widely seen as having brought stability. And the worst of it is, John, is that this layers on top Russian history in which 
every time there's been instability of some kind, or almost every time, what happens is a foreign invasion, some kind of deep, deep uh, social uh, discord, strife, etc. There's a period in Russian history called times of trouble. Mm. And this is the thing every child is taught about at school. And this, this was the time the, the, the Poles and the Lithuanians, whoever it was, came and, and took over our country and humiliated us. And we, these great people, were under the boot. And before that, we were under the Mongols. And Russian history is all about these periods of chaos and instability in which some external force comes in and ruins us. And all it takes is a strong leader who's going to come in, stabilize things, and take control. So if the only thing in your mind when you hear the word democracy is the 1990s, why on earth would you want to go back there? Mm. 